New governments face old problems, and this time it doesn't look like tech will give us the solutions. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on the new GDP numbers and what they lack. It confirmed what I think we knew, that despite two negative quarters, the economy was not in any real sense in recession. And Sam Zell on why he has more opportunities than ever for good investments. Think about the impact of the doubling of interest rates in eight weeks. This week, Global Wall Street saw three new, or sort of new, governments installed, with Rishi Sunak officially taking over as the new Prime Minister of Great Britain and promising to make nice with the markets. I will place economic stability and confidence at the heart of this government's agenda. This will mean difficult decisions to come. Not to be outdone, Italy also got a new prime minister, and Giorgio Maloney wasted no time in taking issue with the ECB raising rates. It's considered by many to be a rash choice that could have repercussions on bank lending to households and businesses. And although China re-upped President Xi for a third term, he made his own changes to his senior team, surrounding himself with people who see eye to eye with him, which Cornell's Ishvar Prasad says is a fundamental shift of a different sort. The message is quite clear. The technocrats are on their way out. The loyalists are on their way in. But as much as governments may change, the problems they face remain the same, as the United States reported stronger GDP growth than expected despite higher interest rates. And the ECB hiked another 75 basis points, with President Lagarde saying she continues to focus on inflation even though the European economy is slowing. The risks to the inflation outlook are primarily on the upside. The major risk in the short term is a further rise in retail energy prices. Over the medium term, inflation may turn out to be higher than expected. And if Global Wall Street was hoping that tech might help us climb out of these doldrums, it was in for a letdown this week, as the earnings of several big tech companies disappointed, particularly in their guidance about what may come next. Those big tech names, as they have reported this week, you know, look at Microsoft, look at Alphabet today, they really have underperformed in a big way. But in the end, equity markets shook it all off with the S&P 500 up for the second week in a row, this time by almost 4%. And even the Nasdaq rose above those disappointing earnings, overcoming a bad week for the fangs and for the Golden Dragon China Index, and turning what was a loss as of Thursday into a nice 2.2% gain by the end of the week. While the yield on the 10 years settled in just over 4% by the end of Friday, down from about 4.25% at the beginning of the week. Here to sort out a fascinating back and forth in markets are Peter Krauss, chair and CEO of Aperture Investors, and Mona Mahajan. She is senior investment strategist at Edward Jones. So, Mona, let me pick on you first. What did the markets do this week and why did they do it? Yeah, thanks, David. Look, this week was a bit of a tug of war. Uh, on one side of that tug of war, we saw the big cap tech earnings. They were, um, in a word, disappointing. In fact, and you noted this up front, it wasn't necessarily the three key results. It was the guidance across the board between advertising revenue, between uh, cloud computing demand. We're seeing a soft thing there, and that really dragged down the NASDAQ. But on the other side of this tug of war, we saw the Dow up nearly 6% this week. Now, what was driving that? Well, we are certainly starting to hear a little bit more optimism about a Federal Reserve that may be looking to raise rates at a more moderate pace. Now, of course, next week's meeting, uh, the 75 basis point, the 0.75 percent rate hike, um, almost baked into the cake. It's probably going to happen. But really, all eyes will then focus on that December rate hike meeting. Um, will they go 50 basis points or will they go 75? And in fact, we heard a little bit more from some Fed governors that perhaps a more moderate rate of uh, rate hikes probably makes sense here, just given um, giving them an opportunity to pause, assess the economy, see what's happening. So interesting moves in the market this week. We do think more broadly, some of those inflationary trends that we have been seeing, some of the forward looking indicators are starting to show some signs of rolling over. That gives the Fed a little bit more comfort in perhaps going at a more moderate pace. We certainly saw that from the Bank of Canada this week this as well, who went 50 basis points rather than the expected 75.
Peter, what did we say? We heard from Mona, we're hearing some optimism about the Fed. Where are we hearing that from? I, I don't remember the Fed giving us much optimism. <laughs> I don't think the Fed is giving us any optimism. I think that this is an interesting case of are you actually listening to the people who have the power to move the interest rates? If you're actually listening to the Fed, I think it's pretty clear the Fed's moving to squash inflation. And they're not going to stop until inflation goes down. And inflation's sticky, and it's not going to move so quickly. And so the likelihood is, is that we see high rates or higher rates, and that those rates probably top out sometime in 23, and they don't go down until well into 23 or perhaps 24. And I don't think the market has completely digested that. And they're looking for scintillas of hope that are floating around in the market that I would call sentiment, but not fact. Mona, what do you yeah. make of it all? I mean, the Fed, I think, wants some consistent data over time that shows that the inflation is really coming down. You said there are a little bit of indications around the edges. Yeah. Yeah, you know, look, Peter has a point there. They want clear and consistent evidence of inflation moderating. And in fact, they don't want to indicate anything too prematurely. They started to see that in June, and we saw markets start to rally, you know, financial conditions start to ease rather than tighten, which is what they really want to see in markets in order to push inflationary pressures down. But if you look at leading indicators, things like break-even inflation rates, you know, ISM prices paid, both services and manufacturing, if you look at even uh, broader commodity indices, we're starting to see um, some signs of cracks, notably the housing market. And that's the most probably interest rate sensitive part of the economy. Um, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen some real weakening there in terms of home builder sentiment, housing starts, um, even price appreciation that's really kind of moved lower in a more meaningful way. And so, you know, with mortgage rates over 7% at this point, uh, we are starting to see some cracks there. Now, keep in mind, the shelter and rent components of CPI are sticky, um, and they may lag what we're seeing in the actual housing and even in the actual rental markets. Uh, but at some point, you know, the Fed will have to acknowledge that we are starting to see some of, some of these cracks appreciate. And in fact, we will probably need to still get that clear and consistent evident, evidence of inflation rolling over. But markets won't wait for the Fed to announce that. Um, they're going to start thinking ahead of time, uh, looking past, just like they look past this week, some of these weaker earnings, uh, potentially a weaker even uh, rate of economic growth going forward. But markets tend to move about six months ahead of all of that as well. So uh, probably an interesting time to start thinking about positioning, especially for the year ahead. Yeah, I think... I, I, just to follow up on Mona's point on the tug of war, you know, part of the tug of war was driven by nominal growth rates because inflation is very high, prices are being reset, companies are increasing their prices, and the revenues are going up. And the revenues are actually going up faster than their unit growth. In fact, some of the unit growths are actually going down, but revenues are still going up. So that's producing growing earnings, and that was somewhat unexpected, and that strength was somewhat unexpected. You saw it mostly in the Dow companies. The financial entities in Dow companies benefited from a much higher rate environment and much higher net interest income. But that is going to slow because when the nominal growth rate slows and when the Fed finally gets to a slower economy, those numbers are going to shift. And then those companies that are now benefiting from that, they're going to see some headwinds. So, Mona, does the Fed need that nominal growth to slow or even go down in order to get their arms around inflation? Can we get to where the Fed wants to go without that nominal growth suffering a correction? Yeah, that's a pretty narrow path to get to what we call the soft landing and see inflation come down uh, in a meaningful way. Now, you know, what the markets have probably already priced in is some sort of mild recession in the first half of 2023. Um, and, you know, keep in mind, historically, if we do get that scenario, markets are down on average 25 to 35 percent. Every cycle is unique, but we have gotten down to 25 percent in the S&P over that in the NASDAQ already. Um, and so at this point, you know, if we continue to see softness, as we mentioned, in the economics and even in the earnings figures, um, markets may start to look past that. Now, what's interesting here is, of course, to Peter's point, um, what's held up very well this year thus far, of course, has been value parts of the market, defensive parts of the market. You know, think about your health care, your staples, your utilities, all also kind of inflationary hedges there. The question is, as we get towards a peak potentially in a Fed funds rate, uh, as we look towards uh, the 10-year Treasury yield stabilizing and potentially moving lower, um, do we want to start complementing some of that 
value defensive with maybe starting to pick up quality parts of growth. Similarly, in the bond market, we've seen a um, huge kind of influx into the shorter end of the curve, that, that two-year, avoiding any sort of duration plays as the Fed is ra raising rates, and rightfully so. But now, as we're thinking about the end of that, we're thinking about inflection points more than anything else. Probably an interesting time to start thinking about complementing your bond portfolio as well. You can finally lock in 10 years of, of close to 4%. Um, that's a pretty phenomenal uh, non-zero rate that we've seen over the last 10 years uh, that investors can start thinking about more seriously. Yeah, you know, people are looking at losses in the U.S. Treasury market. If you own 10-year Treasuries, they're down 18% mm -hmm. total return. So to Mona's point, people are probably afraid of duration right now, and that means it's probably a good time to buy. If you look at the, at the equity markets, let's look at the small cap market for a second. Russell 2000 probably bottomed in June and is probably looking towards you know, some kind of stability and growth into the first quarter of 2023. That's the tug of war we were talking about. The, the cyclicals, the larger cap companies benefiting from this nominal growth rate, they're, they're still creating some value for, you know, for investors, but the real opportunity going forward is not going to be in those stocks. It's going to be in the small cap space, in the growth space. You know, as I say, at the end of the day, you want to buy a company whose earnings grow at 15 percent, not earnings grow at 5 percent. And that's still going to hold true <laughs> going forward. <laughs> so we're going to pick up exactly that when we come back. Mona Mahajan and Peter Cross will stay with us as we turn to some investment advice to carry us toward the end of the year. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Time alone will tell whether Black Monday enters the history book as the day American confidence was so shaken that a premature recession resulted, or merely as the day the computers went wild and through the wonders of so-called program trading turned a normal correction into an early Halloween. That, of course, was the one and only Louis Ruckheiser on Wall Street Week, the Friday before another Halloween, like we're having one this coming Monday. But that one was back in 1987, just after so-called Black Monday, when the Dow Jones lost 23 percent in a single day. And people back then were trying to figure out what went wrong. The number one movie in America that week was Fatal Attraction. And the number one song? Well, it was Bad by Michael Jackson. We still have with us now Peter Krauss of Aperture Investors and Mona Mahajan of Edward Jones. So, so, Peter, let me come to you. I mean, it's not a Black Monday. We haven't seen that by any means. Thank goodness. Right? And I remember that day. <laughs> by the way, I do, too. I was practicing law back in, uh, in Washington. But, but give us some investment advice here. You started in that direction with small caps and duration. If you're putting money to work right now, where does it make sense to do that, given all the uncertainty? Well, I, look, I, I think Mona uh, said it as well. There's three places that are in distress. One is long duration fixed income. So whether it's treasuries or high yield or long duration bonds that have been absolutely crushed this year, those securities are likely going to provide attractive yields going forward. They're not going to reduce their volatility. They're still going to have a fair bit of price volatility to them. But, you know, this is a time when you can start to think about getting a little longer and moving out of the very short duration, which, by the way, is also paying very well. And you can buy short duration corporate investment grade bonds at 5% or even 5.5%. So that looks pretty attractive as well. But I think leaking out a little bit into duration makes sense. On the equity side, you know, I think you can't abandon the growth world. I mean, the tech uh, world today or the tech uh, news in the last few days is obviously very negative. But there are companies that are not necessarily tech, but are growth companies. They're either consumer oriented. Uh, or they're industrial companies that have fast growth. And not paying attention to those is going to miss a trick, that whether they're small cap or mid cap or even large cap, but most likely you're going to find them in the small cap space. So I look at Aperture, our view is you know, small cap's a very interesting space. The beta's cheap, and it's a place where we're probably going to see the first move when this market recovers. Well, that's what you said earlier. The small caps come back first. Mona, do you agree with that? And if they come back first, what comes back second? What comes back third? Because that <laughs> indicates where you want to be and where you don't want to be right now. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Peter's absolutely right. When you look historically, coming out of any sort of downturn or recessionary period, the thing that tends to lead us out are small cap names. And interestingly, this time around, small caps do tend to also be more domestically oriented. And perhaps when you look across the globe, you're seeing a European economy more exposed to the geopolitical issues, the oil and energy crisis. You're seeing an Asian economy more exposed to a Chinese economy that may be slowing. So, in fact, the small cap universe is starting to look more and more interesting as well. Uh, we probably will have some months of volatility ahead as we stabilize, get through a potential downturn. But I think that is a place to start thinking about. Um, similarly, you know, across equities and fixed income, we talked about complementing equities. So, you know, think about the stuff that has been more, quote unquote, beaten up this year. Um, there is value starting to merge in a lot of that. And again, when you look historically, uh, the 12 months after the Fed, the final Fed rate hike, equities broadly are up on average, and this is back till since Fed rate hiking cycle since 1940, on average up about 16 percent after that peak Fed funds rate. So if you think it's coming sometime in February, March, maybe earlier, um, there, there's certainly an interesting opportunity starting to form. And of course, uh, within equities, the other parts of the market, aside from small caps that tend to perform well coming out of a downturn, are the more cyclical and growth parts of the market. And when growth is slowing, you know, investors tend to gravitate um, towards finding growth in their portfolios. So everything that uh, we've talked about, and Peter and I have probably reiterated a couple of times now, but think about duration, think about quality growth. Um, opportunities are certainly forming. Look, I also think that don't misunderstand a, a rising economy or a rising market that you might have in the next few months for a market that is absent volatility. There's still plenty of shoes to drop, and credit and leverage lending is one of them. And we don't know how the market's going to react to defaults. We haven't seen a significant default cycle really since, frankly, 2003, 2004. 08 was a liquidity crisis, and you know, 2020 was very short. So you could have some defaults here in corporate uh, and in you know, other types of securities, real estate. Um, and I think that that's going to have some effect on the volatility. But investors have to, walk, have to live through that volatility. They can't get knocked out of the market. Because if you do that, you're going to miss the opportunity. Uh, Mona, talk about the overall structure, the paradigm, as it were, of investing. We are going, it looks like, from a world low inflation, low rates, into higher inflation and perhaps significantly higher rates. At the same time, there was a good long period of time when it was basically there was no alternative, so people went into a lot of alternates, a lot of riskier things. What happens in this new world? Because it's not like the old world necessarily. Yeah, you know, that's, that's spot on. And in fact, uh, we all know the TINA acronym, there is no alternative. It served us well, uh, probably from the great financial crisis through the pandemic. Um, we saw a lot of investors pushed out the risk curve um, in order to get that return that they were seeking. And of course, as raise, uh, rates rose pretty rapidly through 2022, what we did see is a lot of the more speculative parts of the market have started to see the air let out of those tires as well. You know, think about the SPAC market earlier this year. Year, the meme stock market, uh, even crypto to some extent. We've seen uh, large you know, compression in valuations, large downturn in, in values overall in a lot of those more speculative bubbles. And in fact, that probably sets us up for a more interesting time in the next 10 years. You know, the, the one nice thing that's happened over this kind of downturn in markets this year is that valuation compression has come in beyond what we've typically seen historically. So the S&P PE multiple, for example, has come down over 25 percent um, this year already. So the valuation correction, in our view, has likely already happened. And that sets us up nicely uh, but to your point, in an environment where we'll probably not return to zero rates, but with growth at 2 percent, inflation hopefully re returning somewhere in that 2 to 3 percent, um, yields may also be somewhere in that 2 to 3 percent range. And so in, in that scenario, you think about discounting your cash flows uh, at a higher rate. And so really that does put um, more pressure to prove your business models, especially those business models that expect cash flows in the out years. Um, but the more steady parts of the market that have proven business models, that have proven cash flows, those valuations are starting to look attractive here. And I think that's um, really what investors will have to think about in this new environment. I'm a little bit more of a hawk. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that um, Inflation is going to be in the 2 to 3 percent range. I think you have to have a real rate of interest. We have not had a real rate of interest since really 2008. 
So if you add another 100 basis points or so, you're talking about 3 4%, you know, 4%, 5% Treasury. And I think that's normal. That's a real world. And in that world, why would people necessarily look for just private investments? Because in the public markets, then you can get paid 5% or 6%. So if you think about large pools of capital, pension plans, insurance companies, large savings organizations that have large, large amounts of fixed income, they've been suffering for 10 years with almost no returns. So they're getting pushed to get an extra 100 basis points or 150 basis points with private securities. Now, that market's changing dramatically. And the incremental dollar might not actually flow to where it had been historically. Well, and just very briefly at the end, Peter, you may not know about that, that uh, uh, valuation compression that Mona talks about in the private markets for a while. You definitely won't. Uh, that's always been a smoothing operation. But I think it's very important for investors when they look at their balance sheet at the end of this year and they think about rebalancing, that they consider what the real values are in their private assets because the real values are probably lower than what's being reported. You know, they could use a little mark to market maybe in their private Perhaps. asset. Perhaps. Okay. Thank you so much. It was really great to have you both with us. Peter Krauss of Aperture Investors and Mona Mahajan of Edward Jones. Coming up, we're going to look ahead to next week on Global Wall Street right here on Bloomberg. in Asia, it is the battle of the financial hubs. So Hong Kong is set to host the banking heavyweights of the world for an investment summit. We're going to be seeing the heads of Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Citigroup. All of them are expected to attend with the focus among officials on proving that the city is still open for business. Now, it recently slipped in the financial centre rankings versus Singapore, which is also hosting a major fintech event. That one starts on Wednesday. Earnings-wise, the spotlight shifts to Japan in the days ahead. We've got Toyota, Sony. They're among the highlights for us. With investors, they're going to be looking to gauge the impact of a weak yen and on high alert for any adjustments to forecasts. It's a big week for the Bank of England. It's set to become one of the first major central banks to actively sell bonds held on its balance sheet. After QT gets underway, the BOE also has a rate decision to attend to, with investors pricing in a 75 basis point hike at this Thursday's meeting. In the Middle East, Adepec, one of the world's biggest oil and gas conferences, kicks off. Bloomberg TV will be speaking to many of the top players in the industry and from fossil fuels to climate change. Last but not least, the COP27 conference gets underway in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt on Sunday. The focal point of the week will be the Fed's policy decision on Wednesday. Market pricing showing investors overwhelmingly expect the FOMC to boost interest rates by 75 basis points for a fourth straight meeting. Though we should say that pricing beyond November suggests j Powell could signal a downshift to 50 basis points for the following meeting in December. Economic data next week centers around Friday's release of the October payrolls report, which is expected to show U.S. employers having added the smallest number of jobs since the pandemic disruptions in 2020. Elsewhere, earnings season continues with more than 100 S&P companies reporting, including Pfizer, Uber, Roku, Etsy, Kellogg, and Moderna. And finally, Netflix's lower price advertising tier is set to officially launch in the U.S. It'll cost you $7 a month. And remember, no more password sharing. David? Coming up, famed investor Sam Zell. He's a veteran of Wall Street Week, and he's back now to give us his advice on investing in these difficult markets and why he is seeing more opportunities than ever. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. What a difference a few rate hikes make. Not that long ago, when interest rates were at record lows. The easy days where they dump money on you and you don't have much inflation and you don't have much tightness, those are past. You almost couldn't avoid making a deal and setting new records for M&A. 
we are continuing to see a just tremendous momentum in U.S. m a But things have changed. Money isn't free anymore. We have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a, a painless way to do that. There isn't. And credit is cutting into that record deal flow. I'm looking now at credit spreads in the mid 400s, and they just look too expensive to me. So what does that mean for the deal maker? And are there many deals that still make sense in this new world? There's still more room for for we think these spreads to tighten. Probably at this point, you know, best opportunities are in the non-investment grade market. And now we turn to a dealmaker par excellence. He is Sam Zell. He is the chairman and founder of Equity Group Investments. Sam, welcome to Wall Street Week. I know you've been Thank on this program much. in the past. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about what an investor does in this new environment of increased inflation and increased interest rates. First of all, tell me what's going on with your company. Are you seeing less deal flow? No, just the opposite. Uh, we're seeing more deal flow. We're seeing more situations where. Companies are having difficulty uh, figuring out what to do. Uh, we're seeing situations where nine months ago, uh, financing a transaction of X Y Z size was nothing. You know, it was you know, m as you said, money was free. Uh, what's changed dramatically? I mean, think about the impact of the doubling of interest rates in eight weeks. Double, you know, just eight weeks earlier, uh, interest rates were, you know, two and a half to three, and now they're five and a half to six. That's an enormous uh, change, and, and, and it's going to slow down everybody's activity. It's going to, for sure, uh, impact getting deals done. But in our particular case, because, frankly, I, I've oftentimes told the world that, you know. When I'm liquid, the stock market can't go down. It only goes down when I'm illiquid. <laughs> and here I am sitting there with a level of liquidity I've never experienced in my life because my focus for the last three and a half years has been on nothing more important than liquidity. Uh, so uh, you've got a significant deal flow, if anything, is bigger than it was before. What about the quality of the deals? Are they different from what they were, for example, pre-pandemic? I think they are because I think they're a little more realistic. Hmm. Uh, I think in, in pre-pandemic, when money was free, uh, there were transactions. I mean, the whole SPAC market was a, you know, we did a SPAC and chose not to take it to the next level. Because when we did the SPAC, SPAC seemed like a very interesting way to, in effect, monetize opportunity. Uh, it very quickly became a highly speculative scenario dependent on preposterous valuations uh, that ultimately led to the crash of the whole SPAC market. Uh, you know, the world has changed a lot since then. And, uh, and the change is basically uh, modifying what you can do. On the other hand, <coughs> there's always demand for capital. Uh, and there's always that demand is always on the on the the shoulders of those that have pr preserved the quality. So let's talk about some uh, specific investment opportunities. Energy. Yeah, I mean you know energy terribly well. Yes. Do you see opportunities in energy right now? There's been a lot of tumult in the marketplace because of Russia and Ukraine and all sorts of reasons. Yeah, I uh, I mean we continue to do something in the energy space, not as much as I would have thought when we when this period began. Uh, the, the volatility in the energy space has been so extreme. Uh, I mean, just think about it. Within a 12-month period, the price of oil, uh, you, know, vi you know, vacillated between 30 and 120. Uh, that's an incredible level of volatility. Makes making investments extraordinarily difficult and challenging. Do you see a prospect of a little less volatility? Because you have on the one place OPEC plus trying to limit things. Now you get the U.S. government, which if it's not trying to regulate the price of oil, it looks kind of like it is because it says sure. when it's going to sell and when it's going to buy. So it looks like it's got a bid and ask price. Yeah, but we also have a, a legend. We also have an administration that's very anti-oil, and uh, and and to, in, in my judgment, that anti-oil provision 
is only going to hurt the United States. I mean, we were producing 11 million barrels a day of oil. Uh, I don't know what we're doing now, but I think it's down two or three million barrels a day uh, as we've cut back on uh, capital for, the, for, for fracking, et cetera. Uh, not a healthy set of circumstances. Now, the oil companies uh, almost invariably say it's because of the administration, because of regulation, and their move toward renewables, things like that, so they don't want to make the investments. The administration says, no, 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 you could simply make the investments. The problem is that your investors want it returned to them, that it's really a market phenomenon. It's not the government. I'm sorry. I don't, I mean, I, I've, I've heard that speech made by the government. I don't believe that in, this, in the least. Uh, I think, you know, what, what we have is we have a uh, eco-friendly government that doesn't understand that even if there is a future, a non-fossil fuel future, the idea that it's going to happen in 15 years, uh, I mean, talk about sunk cost. I mean, just, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so uh, we're, in effect, creating a shortage by virtue of depleting oil, or depleting capital into the fossil fuel area that creates inflation that uh, it just doesn't make any sense. Sam, as I recall, you bought some distressed assets in oil back in 2019 that's, there that's about. That's correct. Did that turn out to be a good deal given how badly we need the oil now? Um, probably 50-50. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, again, uh, it, it, it didn't do as well as we expected because the volatility in that commodity was just beyond belief. I mean, no, nobody had ever seen that happen before. Are you interested in nuclear? I mean, a lot of people say we can't get to where we want to go without some nuclear component. Yeah, I, I, I personally agree with that. Uh, it, it, it's like cryptocurrency. It's, uh, it's one of those areas where I don't understand it enough, well enough, to be able to invest in it. Uh, but given the difficulties with fiat currencies you've identified, I understand you have bought some gold, not a lot. Yes. Uh, first time in my life over the last few years, I've bought gold securities and actually bought hard gold. And are you a buyer going forward? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I bought it kind of as, a he as my own definition of a hedge. Um, I haven't done well with it. I haven't lost on it. But... Uh, but in a world where I think uh, fiat currencies are being massacred mm. uh, or, or, or hurt, uh, I think in that kind of a world, uh, more focus on some hard currency is relevant. Uh, you're very much identified in a lot of people's minds with real estate. As I recall, yes. you started that maybe when you were in law school at University of Michigan on the Undergraduate. side. Undergraduate. Un undergraduate, yes. undergraduate, University of Michigan. So talk to me about real estate, where we are right now. We've got some record high rent prices. We've got mortgage rates going up. Tell us your view on the real estate market right now. For all practical purposes, I haven't bought anything in 10 years. Uh, and where the opportunity has created, I've sold it a lot. I felt that the real estate market generally has been overpriced, uh, particularly in the, on the private sector. Uh, as opposed to, I think the public markets have actually done a very good job of uh, sensitizing people to what's going on in real estate. Uh, on the private side, uh, I mean, we, we took over a, a public REIT seven years ago uh, with, I think it was $13 billion of assets. We bought nothing with that portfolio and sold 142 out of 145 properties. What's really incredible is we sold 142 properties and I don't have one sense of regret. <laughs> Not one of those deals do I see, geez, I wish we hadn't done that or waited in the, you know, if anything, we should have sold it faster, earlier, quicker. Uh, because it was, you know, it was because of free money, uh, it created a, a, a price structure that, uh, frankly, was very disadvantageous to the buyer. Sam, it's great to have you back on Wall Street. Thank you so much. That's Sam Zell. He is chairman and founder of Equity Group Investments. Coming up, we wrap up the week with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
to Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston, and we are joined once again by our very special contributor to Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, welcome back. Great to have you. Let's start with those U.S. GDP numbers that came in. Showed we were back into growth, modest growth. What did you see in those numbers that would indicate where we are headed? I think it's hard to know. It confirmed what I think we knew, that despite two negative quarters, the economy was not in any real sense in recession at uh, this point. But if you look through the numbers to private domestic demand, which is probably the best indicator of economic strength, it really wasn't very strong, well below 1% for the third quarter. And so I think what we've now had for nine months is essentially no GDP growth and inflation on core measures probably stronger than it was at the beginning of the nine months suggesting that we've got real challenges ahead. There continue to be arguments that inflation rates are going to come down, but we haven't yet seen them uh, come down. So I don't think the fundamental uh, picture that a soft landing remains an enormous and unlikely challenge is very different than it was before we got these numbers. Well, we're getting some political blowback now, as you know. Sherrod Brown, the senator from Ohio, wrote a letter to Jay Powell. It's followed by Mr. Hickenlooper, senator from Colorado, saying, you know, we shouldn't give up these gains we've had in employment and the progress we've made in the name of fighting inflation. Are uh, we going to see more and more of that political pressure, do you think? So I think there are two points. The first is that the political pressure is a counterproductive strategy from the point of view of those who launch it. Frankly, the Fed doesn't listen, and if anything, feels more pressure to prove its independence. So they don't influence short-term rates and what the Fed actually does. But they do raise questions in the mind of market participants, and they raise long-term rates. So political pressure is a fool's game and actually probably makes financial conditions tighter than they otherwise would be. And that's entirely apart from the merits of the argument uh, being made. I yield to no one in how much I loathe unemployment and want unemployment to be as low as it possibly can be over time. The concern is that, as in the 1970s, if we don't contain inflation, we set the stage for much more financial instability and unemployment. And that is the argument that has to be made by uh, those who are on the dovish side. They say that the Fed is going to be counterproductive and overdo it. A corollary of that view is that they should think either that the Fed should abandon its 2% target or that they're going to push inflation below 2 And I think it would be helpful if every critic of the Fed were asked exactly that question. Are they really saying that 2% inflation should not be the goal, in which case they should describe what their attitude is towards inflation and how they expect it to work out over time? Or are they expressing the view that the Fed is acting so strongly that it's going to produce so large a recession that inflation is going to fall below 2 Larry, let's take a bit of a longer view, as you did this week in some of your tweets, actually. We had a study out showing how much we lost in our children's education because of the pandemic, something like six months. And you translated that, actually, into what that really means for the economy. Tell us about that problem. Look, we talk on this show about financial capital, and it's very important. But human capital is even more important. And what a generation of economic research has now shown is that human capital is the most important determinant of our economy's long-term growth and most important determinant of the fairness and equity with which incomes are distributed in our society. And so when we see six months or a year's loss in children's achievement, that's a 5 to 10 percent decline in the value of human capital for tens of millions of children. And if you add up what that value is in terms of the lost earnings down the road, it's comfortably into the trillions of dollars and not just a few trillion. So we've gotten some 
really very, very discouraging news. And it points up the importance of our doing much more and much better on uh, what we're doing in the whole education system. We can't fix what happened. We can't fix the non-learning that took place when kids were at home uh, during COVID. We can do everything we can to double down on uh, learning going forward. And that's about how our schools are organized. That's about who's staffing and teaching in our schools. That's about making sure they're adequately resourced. And in my view, that's absolutely critically about accountability for everyone, accountability for those teaching and administering uh, in the system, and also accountability for uh, the kids, whether it's the fact that close to 50% of all the grades in the Ivy League are A, straight A, not A minus, or whether it's social promotion in too many of our schools, or whether it's the move away from testing because we don't like the messages uh, that tests send relative to our social aspiration. We have got to get more serious about actual knowledge acquisition in our education system at every level. Larry, we started the week with President Xi coming out and re unveiling his senior management team, if I can put it that way, which surprised some people because there were no uh, perceived as moderates at all. They were really people who are very much aligned with him. He also had a fairly aggressive speech on uh, his economic policy in China. What did you make of where China is headed? Certainly the markets didn't like it very much. I think uh, anybody who thought that the posture of Chinese policy was politicized before the party congress, but would be reformist after the party congress, got absolutely nothing to make their views confirmed. They didn't get it with respect to COVID. They didn't get it with respect to personnel. They didn't get it with respect to rhetoric on the policy substance. So given what happened, I wasn't surprised to see uh, markets respond uh, with disappointment. Now, ultimately, what happens is going to depend not on what was said and just which personnel appointments took place at this party Congress. Ultimately, it's going to depend on how things in the Chinese economy play out, and it's going to depend on the judgments that President Xi uh, makes. Um, I'm not optimistic for China's economy for reasons we've discussed in either the short run or the long run, but we will have to, we will have to see. And I think what we can hope for at this point is not any kind of friendship or uh, partnership, <laughs> but a kind of cold detente. Um, in which the U.S. and China recognize that they have to manage their coexistence in their mutual interest, whatever the depths of their hostile feelings or sense of antipathy. And finally, Larry, let's end up on golf, something that you are very devoted to. I dabble in a little bit. Augusta National, it appears that the Department of Justice is now investigating, along with the PGA. Uh, I don't know that we know what the merits of the case, but what was your reaction? I've got no idea what the merits of any of it are, but I have to wonder at a time when the Justice Department, the president are claiming that we've got massive problems of monopoly and concentration in our economy, and when inevitably legal resources are finite, whether protecting millionaire, multimillionaire PGA players from some kind of exploitation is a sensible allocation of resources and a sensible uh, judicial priority. Even on the worst uh, view of what is happening, I see a lot of other abuses in our country that seem a lot more serious. And so I wonder uh, about this choice, and I wonder whether there isn't some headline-seeking uh, element in it. But again, I'm not 
aware of uh, any details on the merits. Okay, Larry, thank you so very much. Always great to have you with us. That's our very special contributor for Wall Street, Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, they say the markets are always right, but do we always have to listen to them? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Getting it right and getting it wrong. Nothing feels better than having plans work out even better than we'd hoped. Pfizer betting big on mRNA and coming up with a COVID vaccine. There's no option of failing, and there's no way that we can do it because failure is not an option, and if not us, then who? Or the Patriots going for the 199th draft pick and coming up with Tom Brady. But what happens when it goes wrong? When you take a big public position and get your head handed to you, like President Putin deciding to invade Ukraine, expecting a quick and glorious win. President Putin is failing in Ukraine. This war is not going as planned. Or for that matter, Kanye West, now known as Ye, deciding not to be shy about his anti-Semitic sentiments and losing his mega deal with Adidas in the process. In recent weeks, Ye has made controversial statements, including anti-Semitic posts on social media. That's turned his Yeezy line of sneakers into a lightning rod for criticism. Which brings us to economic policy and getting crosswise of the markets. Liz Truss made her first big move as British Prime Minister be a new budget which the markets promptly and emphatically rejected, leading to her quick departure. I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. So her successor, Rishi Sunak, started his tenure this week by saying he'd make it up to the markets. I will place economic stability and confidence at the heart of this government's agenda. But consider the very different case of President Xi of China, who this week got his way on having a third term, surrounded himself with only his closest allies, and forged ahead on his aggressive economic policy, which led the markets to give another big thumbs down, as Mary Lovely of the Peterson Institute explained it. One of the big things that came out of this is that we're going to stay the course with uh, Xi-anomics. And that means continued centralization of power. We're staying the course, and the course doesn't look that great from the market's point of view. No one thinks President Xi is about to pull a Liz truss. So in the course of a week, the markets won one and lost one. And the tie may be broken just over a week from now when Americans go to the polls in the midterm elections, with their opinion of President Biden's economic policies very much on the ballot. Jared Bernstein from the White House wants voters to focus on all the jobs that have been created. Our top line objective here is to maintain the economic gains we've made for working Americans uh, while significantly easing price pressures. Time, as they say, will tell. But from what we've seen so far, what James Carville said 30 years ago remains true in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and I guess we'll see about China. It's the economy, stupid. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.